Welcome back to another episode of Grab All Love. I'm your host, Melissa Ledger. As you notice, I'm trying out different songs for the podcast, so you hear Audio Jungle in the background because I haven't really chosen one yet. I kind of like this idea of just mixing it up a little bit. So let me know what you think of that. I'm going to talk today about heartbreak and uh, a a few different topics, but I have a very special client that I've been messaging. And a lot of times if I'm messaging you and we've worked together, I give you the option to message me updates about the relationship and I'm always willing to give you feedback. So if you become a private coaching client of mine and we're working through a specific relationship, uh, I'm happy to help you through the details. And if you give me updates, we kind of get a texting relationship going. So I've been texting her and the relationship was going great and they were clicking. I think they'd been together for about, I'd say, we'll say six months to be safe. And all of a sudden he's saying, I'm sorry, I have to break up and I don't want to give too many details. So I'm very conscientious of your privacy, but let's just say for the sake of this conversation, he's like, everything's fine. And he hasn't displayed any gumball guy tendencies or any signs of that. He looks like a nice, normal guy, and you were having a great relationship, and you were having fun, and you even fell in love, and they even said, I love you, after several months of dating. And then he just becomes different, says he feels different, gives you mixed, mixed signals on why he's walking away. She asked him if he was afraid. He said, maybe. Um, but that he just wasn't feeling the same, and he said, I can't give you what you deserve. I can't give you what you need. So I just want to tell you, like, those words, I, I always get, I always got annoyed with that because it actually, it, oh, I was like, what does that sound? It's still my music playing in the background. I didn't turn it off. It actually is, it's making the decision for someone else of what they need. Like when someone says, I can't give you what you need, then that should come from me saying to them, I need this and you're not giving it to me. But if they come up with something that they think you need and you've never talked to them about it, or they just say it in general and you're like, what is this thing you think I need? I I don't get it. So I told her that you know, obviously the, the, the devastation of a breakup. So this podcast is about breaking up. It's about the guy that just leaves and, and really gives you not a lot of information or says those things like, I can't give, can't give you what you need. And I talked about this in another podcast of like, um, I think it was why we can't let go of the wrong guy. And there's some elements and aspects of this because I feel like, you know, sometimes people say, Melissa, how do you know this? How do you know all this stuff? And the more I do this, the more I feel like I'm talking about the same guy or the exact same emotional issues. And in this case, what it sounds like, and I don't know this person directly, but just based on experience, what it sounds like is sometimes it's either a gumball guy or it's not a gumball guy. Either way, they, they, they're depressed before they meet you. And if you're, if you're feeling, I've, I've had this happen to me before where I've been depressed. I haven't been feeling that great. And then you meet somebody new and all of a sudden there's this rejuvenation that's comes into your life. You have somebody to hang out with, you've got chemistry and it's exciting and you're going on dates and you're, you're meeting people and it's so fun. And so for a while, you can forget about your depression because it kind of pulls you out of it. So, and I'm I'm hesitating because that's sort of like gumball love, not that they are an attention addict, but I want you to think of it as the gumball can be the drug that gives that sense of euphoria where they are sort of in a drug state because infatuation can make you feel like everything is so great. It can give you that high. And then when they say, I feel differently now, 
it's because that high levels out. And if they're riding on the feeling versus the connection, that's the response you might get. And it doesn't mean that they're not able to connect with you. Because I think a lot of times they are connecting, but if you feel really bad, I always talk, I can talk about this better when I put it on myself that way. Like if I'm feeling really bad about myself, I can, I can build a connection with someone, but you know how it is when you're out to lunch with your friend and you're preoccupied and she's telling you something and you know that you need to be more present for her and you just can't because you just feel crappy. And maybe it's something you really can't share with her or you don't want to share, you're embarrassed about, or you're just feeling low and you can't really figure out why. And she's talking and you're, you're like, you feel like you're glazed over because you aren't really connecting in that moment. And now a lot of us that are extremely self-aware you're very self-aware if you're listening to a podcast like this, we will apologize to our friend and say, I'm sorry, I was weird at lunch. I've just got a lot on my mind. And we kind of reconcile that later. But imagine if you really didn't know that that was going on or you didn't understand why you were feeling that way. Sometimes I think we have this low-grade depression I was talking to my sister about this and I'll, I was saying like, and I just feel like uh, that anxiety is, is so prevalent with so many of us. And she said, I think it's our electronic devices. We're just, we're always like, there's always some notification going off. And, and I think that that's, I think she's really onto something where it's just created this um, like high alert status or something, which I think is just bringing on a lot of anxiety. And so we have to be constantly aware of what's going on and what we're feeling and why and how those feelings, I'm sorry, how that is coming across to other people. Like if I am not aware and we go through these, we all go through these phases in life where you can look back and go, man, I went to that thing and I didn't ask anybody how they were doing or I should have said, hey, how's work? Or you just kind of get into yourself or you're not you're not present and you're just sort of bouncing around. Like sometimes you're like really into yourself or you're disconnected and you're just kind of there, but you're not present. So when you're disconnected with yourself, you cannot connect with other people. And this is not a destination. This is something that we have to work on all the time. And just, it's a daily thing, right? Like you can wake up in a bad mood. You can wake up feeling really sad. And I often wake up feeling like, I'll wake up and I'll feel really depressed. And then I'll lay there and be like, what is, what is wrong? There's nothing even wrong right now. Like, okay, bills are paid and got a good job and you live in a great apartment. Like your family's great. You have great friends. Like I'll go through the list and be like, why do I feel this way? But see, if I just didn't think about that stuff, and, and I have to override it sometimes. It's like, okay, get in the shower and I have to, I turn on a podcast and I'll usually go to a spiritual podcast in the morning like Joel Osteen or Joyce Meyer or just something that I know is going to start my day. Or if like I want to just, like if I'm feeling lazy, I'll turn on Gary V because he makes you feel like Gary Vaynerchuk, who's a uh, podcast for entrepreneurs. If you haven't heard of Gary Vee, you've been living under a rock. No, I'm just kidding. If you're not in the entrepreneur world, you may not have heard of Gary Vee, but um, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I have to, we, we all have to think about when we get into those weird funks, we need triggers and, and help to get us back on track and to get us in our highest self mindset. You know, often when I feel low, if I come on and do a podcast, it puts me in my highest self mindset because I need and always want to be fully present for you. And so if I'm feeling kind of, if I do a podcast, I just, it's like I'm snapped out of it almost immediately. So we, we have to be uh, conscientious and aware of that. So when we're dating people, look, it's impossible to know this stuff about people right off the bat. I mean, they've got a good job and they've got friends and family and, and you're like, Melissa, he's a, he's a great guy. Just like this client of mine, she's, he's a great guy. There's nothing she could have done differently. 
you know, she's fabulous and he's great. And and he he doesn't have to, doesn't make him a bad guy. This is what makes some of these even harder. It's sometimes it's easier when they're a, a huge jerk, but when we see someone struggling and we love them and we care about them and we feel like we can't reach them because they're so disconnected, it, it's, it's heartbreaking in that aspect because I've felt like uh, T.D. Jakes, another preacher, um, he does a lot of, he's a preacher, but I don't really connect with him and it's preaching as much as I do like his books and when he's doing interviews uh, because he does things that are not necessarily um, r- religion. He's Christian, but he has some great uh great content that's not necessarily Christian focused, but it's about instincts. It's about love. And one of his comments was, when you love somebody that is dysfunctional, your feelings are homeless. Your love has no home to go to. And that's really painful. When you're trying to give love and the person cannot receive it, it's it's devastating because it's it's almost like it's stifling. It's like you're you're giving love into a, a dam that's stopped and it won't it doesn't allow it to flow. Love is supposed to flow. That's like w- when you reach out and you try to give someone a gift and they reject it. It's like no, I I I wanted to give it to you and now you're not letting me. And it's like it feels like uh, you know you just feel uncomfortable. But when you're when you love somebody and they were receiving your love or you thought they were and then all of a sudden they stop it's it feels like rejection but it's not that they don't love you back it's going to be hard to explain yeah i i believe guys that just walk away like this it's because they cannot love themselves. They cannot see why someone would love them. I had another client who walked out on a guy and she said, in the end, I just couldn't see why he would love somebody like me, but she felt rejected by him first. And he actually didn't reject her, but she thought she couldn't understand why he would want to be with someone like her. And so when we do that to people or people do that to us, We literally put up a wall and we stop the flow of love. And look, it's a risk, right? Because we've been, this isn't our first rodeo. You know, like when you've been through this and you've been through the heartbreak, it sucks. And when you go through it, you're like, oh man, I remember when I was single and I didn't have anybody in my life and I was just doing this and I was just perfectly fine, you know, and then I'm now in this stupid breakup and what the F am I doing this for? And you just get so annoyed with yourself because you're like, why did I do this? But we are built to love and we cannot stop that. It's, it's just like innately in us. We are, that's what makes us, um, so much more complicated than animals, although I totally believe animals have complex love. Uh, but we are, we have a much more complex brain. We have feelings and emotions and rationalizations, and we are just wired this way. So we can, I, I think that resisting it or trying to outsmart it is also detrimental. So, and I will tell you, I've said this before, gumball love was me trying to outsmart love. Like I was like, oh, okay, if I find these signs, then I'm going to avoid heartbreak. And it's true to a certain extent, but there's points where I've just had to let go and, and take the risk. And I haven't gotten too deep since I discovered gumball love because I've been able to identify the signs of it. But I'll tell you, just because I discovered it, I still had to do the work on myself. I still had to understand why I was attracting them, why they were attracted to me, why I was instinctively just incredibly drawn to emotionally unavailable men and what that, why that was the case. And I really, really, really encourage you to go on that journey yourself because you can listen to all of my advice, but I would say that this advice without any healthy couples in your life that you can talk to or any therapist or any spiritual advisor 
it, I, I don't know that I could have made it. I, in fact, I know I wouldn't have made it without those things because I don't have all the answers, but gumball love is a, it's like, I don't feel like I created answers necessarily, but what I discovered was a pattern. And that's why people think, oh man, she, she can just figure this out. It's because once I hear the pattern, I'm like, oh, there it is. Gumball guy. But sometimes it's not. Like in this case with my client, I don't think that this guy was just using her for attention. And I I think that he was riding a high, that he was feeling better about himself in the beginning of the relationship and really did start to feel good about himself temporarily. But when the reality of how he actually feels started to rear its ugly head, that's when he started to feel differently. And he started to feel differently because how he feels about himself and those demons, if you will, came back and they were just momentarily suppressed. So what I told her to do is think back in the relationship. And because when you're trying to put it together, you, you immediately think, what did I do wrong? But if someone breaks up with you and they say, I can't give you what you need, it's not that I don't love you because you do this, this, and this. You know what I mean? Like, think of how differently that sounds. If I'm going to break up with somebody because I don't think they're a good person or I think that they're selfish or like I was out with this guy uh, when I was doing online dating and uh, he was like, he was really nice to me, but then he would look at the waiter and just bark an order. And I was like, I I really hadn't had someone rude to the waiter before. And it was like, whoa, I'm actually seeing this. He was just very abrupt with service people. And then he just like almost annoyed with them. And it was like, oh, like if I, now if I would have dated him for a long time and seen that behavior over and over again, like that would be a reason, like, I don't want to be with you because I don't like how you treat other people. I feel like you're not nice or I feel like you're selfish or I'm not connecting with you or I don't like the kind of whatever, like you, you, you're, you would, you would be breaking up with them because you don't like their character. You, um, you fall out of love with someone because you see things that really start to turn you off. But someone who says, I can't give you what you need means they think that being with you is, or they think that you being with them is ultimately going to disappoint you. And you're going to get discouraged by their lack. And this drives you crazy when you're in love with them because you're like, sometimes you go, yeah, I see what you lack, but you, where you lack is not an area that I need you to have more. So like, let's say, for example, you know, I have a great career and I make enough money. So if a guy made less money than me, I wouldn't really... I I wouldn't consider that like a problem as long as he was happy in his job and we uh, could enjoy each other's company, then I would just adjust like I would do more things that didn't cost a lot of money, like go to me, things I really actually want to do, like go to museums and go for walks. And, you know, there's just like, it's not about expensive dates. It's not about like, for me, it's not about those things. Now, some women, they want that lifestyle and they expect that. And there's nothing wrong with that. So a guy that was on dates with a girl and she was like always wanting to do, you know, $500 dinners and she had that expectation and he couldn't do that and it th- and it became a problem then you could see where he would be like look i can't i can't give you what you need but when it's ambiguous and you're you're sitting there like what is it you think i need that you're not giving and that's when they can't really answer the question and it gets really frustrating or she asked him are you scared And he said, maybe, which is a yes. So the ultimate thing is we can decode it, but that is, I am afraid I'm not enough. And eventually you're going to see that I'm not enough and you're going to reject me. So I'm going to end the relationship now. So it's on my terms. And I walk away with some dignity instead of sitting here in this relationship waiting and, and feeling worse and worse and worse 
to the point where you actually do break up. Like I've had guys do that where they get so depressed that the guy that my, one of my very last relationships in Nebraska, he, he was so down on himself all the time that that actually did end up being what turned me off because I couldn't deal with that deep depression all the time. It just became such a downer and he was so unaware of himself that it was what drove me to finally end the relationship because I just couldn't deal with so much negativity and just someone that was just always finding the glass half full or even empty. You know, it was just, it was devastating. So sometimes too, I think people know who they really are and maybe they're presenting something that they're not. And so they feel like once they see the real me, that's when they're going to be like, yeah, I'm out. So, you know, it's always a risk, right? All of us are single. Either we found something or they found something in us that they didn't like for the long term. And that used to, I used to really think about different, like guys would say different things and I would just labor over those things like, or, or some guys would be like, you just think you know everything. And it's because I have well-formed opinions about what I believe. I don't think I know everything, but I do, ha- I do have opinions about what I know, if that makes sense. And so some, sometimes guys would get really threatened by if I, you bring up an issue or you have, or you can articulate, like they would get jealous of my ability to articulate and think quickly. And like people compliment on this podcast all the time of how I can just think on my feet and articulate. So they would be, the guys I would date would be threatened by that skill because if I'm in an argument or I I can, I'm, I always say to my friends, like, I have to be really careful if somebody pisses me off, like they do something mean. Like if, if I see somebody mean to like an old lady or like uh, someone was mean to one of my coworkers, some executive, but he was on my level at a company and he was mean to w- one of the uh, front desk girls who was actually my friend. And I just, I can think of exactly what I should, what, what I want to say in the moment. You know, people will say, I always think of the great stuff to say like five minutes later. I don't. I think of it right now and I'm ready. It's like I'm locked, I'm loaded, I've got heavy artillery, I, can, I select my weapons, but I grew up with a family of debaters and so I developed these skills of literally arguing politics, religion endlessly and yes, I can do it, but I don't enjoy that anymore. So now I use my ability to articulate in a much more positive way, like podcasts and, and writing and uh, doing live broadcasts, et cetera. So um, because I realized that I would get into these banter arguments with guys because they would be threatened by me, but then they would pick on me and they would pick fights, but then I could fight back really well. And then they would get irritated with that. So it was like they were, they were insecure. So then they would try to poke the bear, but then when they couldn't win, when they poked the bear, it would just make it worse because, but it was really their insecurity driving the whole thing. So that's just kind of an example of sometimes what guys will do when they feel bad about themselves, they will pick an area that they feel like is your weakness and they, they pick on it because they're feeling so low. They'll pick on maybe weight, uh, like, or uh, like, yeah, you look like you're putting on a few pounds. And then that's just like, if they know that's a sensitive area, which who doesn't have that as a sensitive area, it's really hard to, you know, be strong after a comment like that. Or they'll bring up a failure. They'll bring up past th- things that they know are sensitive to you. Because, and you're, and you're like, how can you do this if you love me? What's wrong with you? And this didn't happen in this other case. I'm just kind of giving you examples. Like how when we're with guys that feel like they can't give us what we need, that's when they start to nitpick us because they're really angry at themselves and what they feel they are not. And they're making it up in their own mind of what they think they should be. And really, they probably should be that thing 
because we all have expectations of where we know we need to be, right? So, but sometimes like, it's like, I know where I feel like I should be in my job and in my career and in life. And so I strive for that. And I'm, but but the difference between a healthy person and unhealthy person is the healthy person will admit this is where I am. I lack in this area. I'm a procrastinator. I need to work on this. And they'll, the partner will encourage and help them in those areas of weakness. They won't point out the failures and make them feel worse because the other, if you have two healthy people, they work together to lift each other up. And so that's what you really want to look for in your friends and also in your significant other is that person that is healthy enough and they aren't perfect, but they aren't feeling so insecure about themselves that they need to put you down to feel better in that moment, if that makes sense. So sorry, I went on a little bit of a tangent there, but I just want to be clear. So I've actually noticed too that um, I had went in a more recent um, like mini relationship or just a guy I went out with a few times, he started to nitpick like that a little bit. And it was interesting because I was, I just saw it for exactly what it was in the moment. And it, when, when you're looking for it, and obviously I, I don't think we can ever get to the point where we're like, Oh, I see where you are and I see where you're lacking. And even though you're saying mean things, it doesn't hurt me. I feel like that's not the case. I think we can only take so much. And even if we're taking a little, it still does damage. Like the death by a thousand cuts, like somebody that just is a little bit, they're toxic or they just feel so low about themselves that they um, are, what's the word? I can't think of words today. <laughs> um, but you know what I'm saying? They're that that kind of person that, they're just a little bit condescending, a little bit rude sometimes. And you know they're not a bad person, but they just aren't going to grow fast enough to give you enough time to build, build a relationship with them where it's going to be healthy. But that said, and I, I ended the relationship or just stopped dating him, but it was interesting to hear the nitpicking. And then um, I actually kind of went with the nitpicking because he picked on an area, and I'm trying to even remember what it was. Um, and God, I really can't even remember, but I was like, yeah, you're exactly right. I do feel that way, or I do those things. And gosh, no, I wish I could remember, but I, I was like, you know what? But I like that about me. I like that weakness in me because, and I can't even remember what the weakness was. I think it was like being emotional, something about being emotional. And I was like, yeah, I can get emotional. I can cry or whatever, but I like that about me because if I don't, if I don't allow that to happen and I'm losing the, what, what we were talking about exactly, I have to think of it, but it was like, if I don't, if I don't keep that about me, then, you know, why would I want to change it? So yeah, I see that what you're saying, but I'm not going to change it. It's amazing when someone nitpicks you and you just embrace the flaw. Then they're like, what? How do you do it? But you can only do that so many times. And then it becomes exhausting because you're, you're putting up resistance, right? And if you have to play defense in your relationship, it doesn't work. Like you cannot be on defense at all in a relationship. So, or offense for that matter, because then we're playing a game. It has to be a partnership. You have to be on the same team. <laughs> Never thought of it. So I was like, uh, I was on a basketball court in my mind. So I hope this is helpful in working out the dynamics of the guy that says, I can't give you what you need. I don't, because I want, instead of you reacting to that and going on the defensive, ask questions like, what is it that you feel like you need, that I need that you can't give me? What do you feel like you need to be? And you know what? I bet you'll get a, I don't know. Because sometimes I think they just don't know. They just feel like I'm a piece of crap and you deserve someone better. That's another one. You you deserve someone better than me. And you know what? They're probably right. Because if they aren't willing to do the work on themselves, then you do deserve someone who is going to be your partner that isn't because that damage 
that they won't fix will damage you. You can't be with a damaged person and not get hurt along the way with them. We have to be really careful of teaming up with someone that we love and trying to fix their damage at the same time. You can't fix their damage. Nobody could have ever fixed mine. When I think about what I did in my journey, and I started going to therapy back in 2000, I think I started going to therapy in 2006. So, wow, 12 years ago. Is that right? 2006, 2016. Yes, 12 years ago. That's crazy. Oh my gosh, I just, time flies. But when I, when I did that work way back 12 years ago, there is nobody but me that could have done that. Nobody but me that can sit down in that therapist chair, take notes, ask questions, face myself, face the hard questions, do the crying afterwards, sit in the car after the therapy session and just like not even start the engine, just sitting there thinking through and understanding how I related to mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, aunts, uncles, cousins, sister, friends, coworkers, bosses, and just recalibrating all of the dynamics that I had made perceptions, false perceptions, created false realities. I mean, it's endless. And it's always going to be a journey, but there are major, I I always say that there's like this big rope with huge knots and then there's little knots. And I feel like at the beginning of therapy, man, we're tugging on like massive, you know, the knot that you're like, when your jewelry chain is like in this huge knot and you're like, I'm going to spend the rest of my life untying this chain. That was probably $5 and I should throw it in the trash, but no, I'm going to spend. And then you just like start like rolling it in your fingers, like that's going to work. And then sometimes it does. Like you're just like, you'll try anything. And then, and then you like really look at the knot and then you're like, okay, I'm going to grab this one part. And then you realize like, that's what therapy's like. If it's a huge knot, it just takes time. But then there are those sessions where you're like, oh my gosh, you see, it starts to loosen up and then the whole thing unravels and you get something huge. And you're like, oh, now I get it. I have the same thing in dance. My teacher will tell me the same thing over and over and over and over again. I'll be like, why can't I get this? It's because my body wasn't ready to do that thing with my hips and my upper body and everything's connected and I just can't get it. And then one day I feel it and it's like, oh, and then he'll be like, oh, finally you get it. But because we've been working on it for weeks or sometimes months, but it's just, it just takes time. So in both cases, I had to show up every day and do the work and do the work and do the work. And just yesterday he said, Melissa, you need to practice more on your own because I can tell you're not practicing and that's why you're losing what you've learned because you're not practicing. So if I just go to therapy, I can't just put my feet up. I've got to keep putting those things into practice, keeping those boundaries. New people come into your life. You've got to look at, evaluate friendships all the time. Is this, is this relationship bringing me up or taking me down? Is this person always talking about something negative? Can they ever be positive? Or am I always giving them a pep talk and trying to talk them off of a ledge? Are they always whining? Are they always complaining? You know, like those kinds of people, we've got to really ask ourselves, like I love Oprah's quote, you are responsible for the energy that you bring to the space. And so all of that is responsibility is such a great word. And if someone isn't taking responsibility for the energy that they bring to the space, for the emotional trauma that they may have experienced, I I don't know why people, they they go through massive things and then they think, oh, I don't need therapy because it's like some kind of a weakness. It's like, well, you you think you worked all that out by yourself? You think that you can experience those things and then that hate and discontent that you feel for this person, this person, you, you just think that you can ride through life with that and you're going to be okay. You know what I mean? Like, why do we think we can do this stuff on our own? We really should not get that cocky about it. And we really should be more like, I just wish it, and and I think it will become much more normal. We go to the dentist when our teeth hurt, we go, we go get our hair cut. Why wouldn't we go to a professional to, to talk about deep rooted pains, emotional pain. For some reason, we think we can quote unquote self-medicate with emotional stuff. And the emotional stuff is what controls us the most. 
So oh, there's a huge rainstorm that's happening. I was going to go to the Met, but I'm going to take the subway most of the way. So today is Met Day. It's Saturday. Um, so I got a facial and grabbed a coffee and just having like this lovely day. I thought I'm going to record a podcast, got my dishes put away, laundry put away, and uh, hand washed my dancing stuff. So i am got, got myself all squared away and I'm going to grab my um, notebook and I'm actually going to go to the Met and get a book about the um, European paintings and just see if I can... I was like, you know, instead of trying to tackle the whole Met, I think I'm going to actually ask somebody that works there how they think I should do it. (laughs) Maybe I should ask somebody that actually lives in the museum every day to tell me how I should tackle it and share my goals with them. So anyway, that's what's on the agenda today. But I'm just realizing that it is pouring. It is pouring rain. Like, I'm not going anywhere if it's raining this hard. I'm sure it'll pass. So anyways, if you hear, you can probably hear that on the microphone. It's really loud. I'm just seeing if it pops up when I'm not talking. No, maybe not. Maybe you can hear a little bit. So anyway, I hope this helps you to um, reconcile these feelings that you have. Because what I want Gumball Love to do for you is I want you to be able to, A, say, is this a Gumball guy? Is this someone that is just seeking attention? And they are just using me for texts and they're just throwing me breadcrumbs or quarters to get gumballs that they want attention on demand that they will disappear and reappear for days? Or is this someone that maybe it's a kind of like gumball love where they did enjoy the attention and they did build somewhat of a connection, but they have so much self-hate in between us trying to build the connection And they think that they lack so much, that that's what's actually holding up the process of connection. And when they do that, it makes it impossible to go to that next step. So in the case of this client, and you know who you are, and if you're going through this as well, but I'm just going to speak to her for a second. In this case, he really was not able to go to the next step. Like you built an initial connection. He went as far as he absolutely could but he stopped because he didn't do the work on his end before he entered the relationship. And unfortunately, you're having to pay the emotional price for that, which is not fair to you. But the other side of this, what I want to give you is that we cannot internalize and say, what is wrong with me? Here's another guy that doesn't love me and that I'm not enough. Don't let his not feeling enough drag you down into that same level. We have to it's okay to cry. Like you're going to cry. It's going to hurt. But I want you to think of it as I'm mourning a loss. It's a death of the relationship, but it is not a reflection of who I am or that I didn't give enough or that I I'm too successful of a woman because those are his insecurities. And there are, I always think of the women that are far more successful than me that make 10 times more money and they're dating men. They find men. So we can't get hung up on levels of success because there's always going to be a guy that's threatened by your success. They are out there and they are being made more and more every day. That is not our problem. So I think that we have to just get better at really, once we are like, okay, I really like this guy and you're going on dates, really start evaluating. Is he happy in his life? Is he happy in his job? Is everything okay with him? You know, and just just as you get to know him better and each time be like, you know, how do you like your job? Is that where you, do you love what you do? And if you see a lot of hesitation and they don't like where they live, they don't like their job, they have relationship issues with family or coworkers or boss, but they kind of shove that away and then they just focus on the fun you're having. That's a big red flag that you want to kind of just keep an eye on and, and know that that could be ultimately what makes him feel like he doesn't have his life under control because men instinctively, I believe are still providers. And even though they don't necessarily have to pay all the bills anymore, they still feel like they need to have their crap together. You know, they, they want to look like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm in a job, I'm making money, I'm organized, I'm successful. They want to feel like a man. And if they don't feel that way, 
and they, but they allow themselves to temporarily be in the relationship and go through the fun part. Eventually who they really are or who they feel they really are comes and bubbles, bubbles right back up and hits them in the face. And then when that infatuation isn't there to support and give them the high, it's like, oh, I feel differently. Well, yeah, you feel differently because now we're just into day to day and you still hate everything about yourself and your life. And my mere presence isn't giving you that lift it used to. So now you don't know what to do because you haven't done the work on yourself. So there's not another girl that's going to be like, oh yeah, she's really what I was looking for. And a lot of times these guys will date below them. They will date girls that have achieved much less, that have less expectations. I honestly wish that they would understand where they are. But see, that's another thing. They don't understand where they are and they can't look at a girl and say, you know, that's somebody that I'm going to feel less than and I'm going to feel like crap about myself because that would take a tremendous amount of self-awareness. Instead, it's kind of like they're shopping at Chanel and they should be at TJ Maxx, you know, but they get carried away in Chanel and all of a sudden they get their credit card bill in the mail and they're like, oh crap, I can't pay for this. And then the bill sits there and haunts them when they knew they should have gone to TJ Maxx. And I was like the worst example ever, but you know, you're Chanel or Oscar de la Rente or whatever. I, I don't know all the designers. <laughs> I know them, but I couldn't pick them out in a lineup to save my life. I'm not, I'm not a fashion girl. But you know what I'm saying? Like they just, they overspend, so to speak, and then they can't afford it. And so then they get stressed out and they don't know what to do. And so that's what I want you to focus on before you go down the road of, I'm not enough. It, that's not it. Do you hear me? That's not it. So it really helps to look at the relationship so much differently. Because you're like, wow, he just can't. I'm, I'm thinking of uh, my, my personal experience where it's like, wow, he just can't like get himself to the point where he feels confident enough in my presence. Like my, who I am is a constant reminder of who he's not in his mind. And sometimes we don't even know what they're creating in their head because I can tell you in two cases what I saw was like exactly what I wanted. And I was 100% willing to go the long haul. But in their minds, it was like, they just felt like, no, I, I can't, I can't be, I, I'm not enough. And there's nothing I could do to make that different. So heartbreak is real. The struggle is there. The struggle is real, as, as we say. But I want you to focus on what you would do if you're mourning a death and not go down. Don't let yourself get depressed. Don't let yourself go down a hole that's unnecessary because it really almost in that, in that case, it has nothing to do with you. There's nothing you could have done differently. And that part sucks because we want to like, it's like, Oh, okay. You're, you're ending the relationship. I invested. I love you. Like, don't just drop it. You, you feel like flailing. It's like, what, what, do you, what do you mean you're just going to leave? It just feels so like unnatural. And so, but what I want you to do is you're going to cry. I want you to go through all the emotions and feel everything. But in the quiet moments where you're not crying and you can like speak clearly and you're talking to your friend, really start to write down the facts. Like, what do, I, what do I know? What actually happened? What did he tell me in the beginning? What were those insecurities? And it'll be kind of like a, a mystery that you put together. And eventually you're going to be like, oh, I see it. And, and you're going to want to say to him, I, I, I feel like this is what you're doing, but I don't, I don't feel that way. But the pep talk, I will tell you, when you give the pep talk, then you shine a big light on what you know their insecurity is. And if he hasn't done the work to really identify those insecurities, then you are like a ship with a huge foghorn light, like here's where your insecurities are and here's where I'm not threatened by that or I don't feel like you're not enough. Like it's like you don't bring it up. You have to, they have to discover it on their own, which is really 
hard because when you're extremely evolved and you've gone through therapy, you can be like, oh yeah, that's this. And it, it seems easy when you've already gone through it. It's just like learning dance steps. Dance in life is so, there's so many parallels. When I, when I learn a dance step, I was just trying to do something yesterday and it was like, I was making it so hard. And then he kept doing it over and over again. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I was like, wow, why was that so hard? But as I was trying to learn it, it was hard for me. I was like, my brain could not wrap around it. And then when I got it, I got it, but I needed the process of learning and struggling. So when we try to give a pep talk or we have this clear view of what their issues are and we try to explain it, it's, it's too much and it's too much reality in their face. And then if it seems that easy for you and it's so hard for him, it's, it almost makes it worse. So I think the best thing to do in this situation, because maybe, you know, I, I don't want to say it's, this is the end, or I don't want to make any decisions for you. So I would just say, instead of like, if you're still talking to a guy and you're, you're trying to figure it out, really just ask questions and listen, kind of channel a therapist in your mind and just say, you know, what, what's been going on? What's been making you feel this way? And he might say, I don't know. Even if you think you really know why, don't say it. Just look at where he actually is and then evaluate if you can hang in that relationship because a lot of times they'll come back and forth. They'll leave and they'll come back because he'll miss you and he'll come back. But he, it's kind of like he's dragging trash bags around. And you're like, I know that you're back, but you still have those trash bags with you. So it's still stinky. Like you got to get rid of that. You can't come back when you still have, you haven't dumped anything off. So you, we need to be aware that they're just dragging this. I miss you. And I know I still have these stinky bags with me. You know, like we, we have to, ask ourselves if we're, not if we're willing, but like, it's like, you can't, you can't allow that. So if he comes back, something needs to be different. Something needs to have changed. Holy smokes. Can you hear the ship leaving the harbor? Thank God it only happens like once or twice a day. Sometimes I do midnight cruises and it's so loud. So, all right. I could go on and on about this because it's my passion and I want to help you guys. And it just breaks my heart to see any of you sad or crying and so hurt because this is like, it just uh, gets me in the feelers and it just reignites my passion for why I do this. And I want to help each and every one of you. So hang in there. And if you're going through heartbreak or you're going through back and forth or someone that you feel is saying those dreaded words, I'm not enough for you. I can't give you what you need. And I hope this gives you a different perspective. So as always, if this resonates, shoot me an email or give me a comment on my uh, latest Instagram posts. Let people know how you're relating to the content or make a post in the private Facebook group. We've got tons of stuff going on in there. I think a lot of people are having epiphanies. We have people that are actually therapists as well, going through the exact same things. So even when you're a therapist, you're going to go through this, these struggles because it's just nobody has all the answers. Nobody is perfect. We're all in this together. And that's what I want you to feel in this, in this journey, in this community, that nobody is perfect. Nobody has it all together. Nobody has all the answers, but together we build this community. We keep each other strong. We realize that we're not alone. And that's, that's the biggest thing. We need to know that we're not alone, that we're not the only ones experiencing this and that it's okay to feel how you're feeling. And even though, and it's like, it's okay to be sad. So many of us feel like we should just be able to get over this so fast. I don't know why we think that, but this is hard. So it's hard. It sucks. It's okay to cry and just keep working through the process. And I believe that when you meet the right person, you'll get it. And then all of these experiences are going to be so helpful. They really will feed into the ultimate purpose and all of the best relationships that you will accumulate throughout your life. So until next time, I will see you soon. Bye-bye.